Hello, I'm here with Jorge. Jorge, who are you? Uh, well, um, well, from the other side of town. Uh, Footscray. Yeah, yeah, I live in Footscray. Yeah. Uh, been a, a, a councillor there in the city of Maribyrnong for the last four years. Um, ending up there, got a few more weeks left. Sick, awesome. Um, we're, we've come here today to chat about housing a bit. Um, what do you think? Yeah, God, housing. Where do you start with housing? I mean, look, I mean, I think everyone's aware of just how much of a crisis we're in. Um, if you're a renter, you're stuffed. If you're on a mortgage but recently started, mm. if you had a small deposit, even worse, yeah. you're stuffed. Um, what are we looking at now? I mean, you're looking at roughly 30 years on average to pay a mortgage. Yeah. And given that most people these days aren't, because you know, you need 20% typically yeah. on a deposit. So yeah. to save that, like if you're going to buy a house in Footscray with a median price of 1.2 million bucks, yeah. that's a big deposit. So, <laughs> you know, by the time you got that, you've been living at home until you're 33, 34, maybe you start paying it when you're 38, yeah. whatever. Um, maybe you pay it off before you die. I mean, that's sort of the promise of housing these days. Yeah, exactly. And if you don't have, if you don't, if your parents are renting, what, like, what have we got set up for you? Yeah, I mean, look, it, there's so many things that play into this. You know, I was reading the other day, um, and most people are familiar with these sort of figures that one in two males mm. are still at home at 29, and women are far behind. Yeah. And the average, I think, is around 26 plus. And housing is a big part of that, obviously, because you know you can't. You know, if you're going to uni, God, when I went to uni, I'm thinking back, I, I came to, we came to Australia and landed in Brisbane. Yeah. I went to uni at Queensland Uni. I used to rent a room yeah. for 25 bucks. My off study payment, because I parents were pretty poor, so it was full off study. Yeah. So I think I got, say, 120. I Probably my best quality of life was back then, because I paid 25 bucks for rent. Yeah. A pot of beer was 80 cents. How you cool. Know? <laughs> and now if you're a uni student, I mean, this is one of the reasons I sort of got sick of teaching at uni because I felt for students because you can't hang at uni, you know, and have yeah. a uni life where you learn about things, you talk politics or whatever it is you're into yeah. because you're working 25 yeah, hours. Yeah. I think the average is about 25 hours for yeah. full-time students. So, yeah. and even then you still can't live away from home, not exactly. if you want to travel or do anything else, you know. Yeah. So it's just so difficult, especially, yeah. you know, for younger people now, you know, housing has become the big cloud over your head, really. Yeah. Yeah. Like like I've been talking to a lot of people about squatting in particular and a lot of the feedback that I get from particularly older people who used to squat in this country is that they don't have time to squat anymore because you know we're all under the the yoke of capitalism work we don't have time to you know go and protect the things that we're looking after and all that kind of stuff it's kind of sad the reality is okay you know we sort of laugh at that side of it but the reality yeah. is it's so draconian now like i was talking yeah. to my partner the other day she works as a coordinator of an adult house and a big part of her job mm. is advocating for these poor people you know women and, and men who are in their 60s mid 60s late 60s still being forced to do job seeker yeah. tasks yeah. you know they've got all sorts of conditions because often the English isn't uh, uh, good enough, they can't advocate for themselves, yeah. so they're being forced into ridiculous yeah. you know, situations. So, I mean, it's just, yeah, draconian, really. Yeah. What I wanted to say was, I'm a socialist, you're a socialist. What's a socialist uh, solution to our housing crisis? What do you reckon? Well, I mean, I, look, I think in a simple phrase, it's public housing. Yeah. You know, public housing would almost solve the problem in Australia or not, yeah. you know, really. Like, if you... If we had a, a mass public housing build program, yeah. not like you know the crap, but the so-called big build of the yeah. local government, which is really a really a raw yeah. giveaway to developers. But if you had a proper public housing build, um, which could be done very quickly, mm -hmm. um, could be done through existing new development. So yeah. it doesn't require um, you know putting in whole new blocks. I mean, for a start, we wouldn't demolish the ones that are there, yeah, <laughs> which nice. is yeah, yeah. the current plan. But then, you know, every time you put up a tower, you look at these towers around here, you know? Yeah. So that's what, a 14-story tower there, maybe? You just put in laws that force developers to put in a percentage of public housing. Done, you know? And also, so you get rid of one of the big arguments that the Labor Party, all yeah. these sort of Labor Party apologists will say to you, oh, the problem with those programs in the past was that they created ghettos. Well, you're not creating a ghetto no, there. You know, exactly. Too. It's it's. Like you're not incentivised to do that. If yeah. you make all of your profit-seeking developments include an aspect of public housing, then you can't do that. Like by design, you can't do that. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, it's really it is an overnight solution. You know, in, in a decade, you, you could solve the, the housing crisis. Yeah, uh, it would change things in many other ways. You know, in Australia, you know, the way that people invest, the way yeah. that people you know secure themselves. You know, for and look, 
you get, you know, we were talking about this before, you get why some sort of small time in so-called investors, the word to use, you know, the yeah. family that's got an extra property, you yeah. get why people do that. Because, Hobby landlords. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you get it because these days there's none of the security there was yeah. in the post-war boomer yeah. you know, period. You know, like the reality is, you know, you look at the, the post-war generation, you know, mm. you had a situation where only one person worked, mm -hmm. typically the, the, the male, but only mm -hmm. one person worked, they could still pay off their house in five, seven years. And they had a retirement that by the age of 60, they were trapped with doing yeah. whatever. That's all impossible now. People are yeah. aware of that. So you sort of get why, you know, you get that, you know, sort of small yeah. time investment mentality. Yeah, because um, yeah, you're trying to, you know, look after your kids and, or like the next generation or whatever. But not everyone has the ability to, to do that. And I think we're leaving those people behind. It's sad. Oh, totally. Just creating a whole lot of, um, well, a whole generation really yeah. that's just going to, struggle to to do any of those things yeah. that you know their, their parents you know the things i think about when i, I compare to our two boys who are 23 mm -hmm. and 20 you know they've sort of adopted our lifestyle yeah. and i feel so good for them compared to a lot of their peers who are really thinking about okay had to rush through uni so i could get a good job so i could get, you know get a deposit so yeah. I could, you know you're thinking why why would you you know yeah sort of give up on all that other part of life especially as a young person you yeah. know like whether it's travel, doing different things, different jobs, but you got to give up on all that if you want to yeah, own a house. Exactly. Which is like, yeah, we shouldn't have to make massive sacrifices to access what is a human right. I think that's ridiculous. Actually, you know, it's interesting that that term is just not—it's non-existent in the Australian political yeah. vocabulary. I mean, it's a human right, not just in terms of sort of left-wing language. It's yeah. a UN thing. It's a, yeah, <laughs> like we're like we're a signatory to that to those two conventions. That, yeah that you know enshrines that as a human right and then we're just like okay that's enough <laughs> we'll call it that and then that's it i mean and you think you know i think before we were talking about this a bit of a tangent but i was thinking about you know how do you get there and i mean in the end maybe and this is i suppose a defining thing about being a socialist too yeah. you know that in the end we rely fundamentally on people power yeah you know? and really that's what's going to happen really because really, the goodwill of governments is not going to come our way when yeah. it comes to housing um, I was thinking back to an experience um, when we were in Venezuela for a while. For a long period there, there was an interesting government. Mm -hmm. Sort of things have got difficult now, but the Chavez government. And one of the things that happened there was that so much of the poor in um, the capital, especially mm -hmm. Caracas, and we're talking millions of people, uh, lived in what were effectively squats. Mm -hmm. Well, what a good government did there when they eventually got to power in inverted commas, the Chavez government, is they just put through a decree that made that all um, homes for those people yeah. but they did it really interestingly they didn't just give people a deed because yeah. they thought well that's going to just exaggerate the individualist yeah. mentality yeah. they said to people if you can form a cooperative of 100 I think was the figure we'll give you the deed for all of it um, and you know that sort of just brings yeah. forth that idea that in the end really it's going to have to be people power um, and you know maybe that's even in housing we haven't really I don't think the left has thought about how do we bring that people's power agenda to housing yeah. you know we do it in other things like yeah. climate change we get out on the street we have rallies yeah. etc and you know, virtually every other issue but how do we bring that people power agenda you know and strategy really it's not yeah. agenda into the housing debate um yeah yeah i don't know <laughs> i got some thoughts i feel like i feel like but to get that kind of consciousness and it is a, a class consciousness when it comes to property in Australia, it's you either have property or you don't, and those are our two kind of classes. You first have to recognise that, that that's, that's the thing, and as people become less and less upwardly mobile in terms of accessing, like having access to landed property and that kind of thing, um, once we recognise that, hey, there's a bunch of us in Australia that will never be able to jump that gap, regardless of how aspirational you are or whatever, um, then we can start talking about what we do about it. I don't think we're at that stage yet, but there are certainly some of us who are, and like you, we can collectivize, we can do stuff, we can do like, we're organizing, you know, squatting, where um, the renters and housing union is something that exists, that used to exist in Victoria as a tenants union that, that no longer exists. And yeah, people come together, like uh, exercise their rights, do like, you know, look at things like rent strikes, look at things like those, those kind of things that we used to do in the past. I think that's how we bring, bring that back. But we have to recognize that there are classes of, uh, we've lost a lot of that language historically. I think. 
Yeah, I reckon it's spot on. And, you know, when you think back, especially, I mean, Australia had a lot of that experience, especially mm -hmm. in the city, Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, mm -hmm. I reckon, back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, even more so in Britain. You know, you look at that squatter, you know, yep. movement. It was an actual movement yeah, you know, in, in, yeah. in England, especially in Scotland. Um, yeah, I think you're right. Look, I think that's sort of the sort of thinking that has to happen, mm -hmm. the sort of, uh, you know, rent strikes. Yep. I mean, you know, and we can do, I think you can, in terms of strategy, you can do certain things that push the envelope a little bit within the sort of the, the halls of power. So, yeah. you know, for example, I've been thinking about in a council level, you know, can we get up things like council run rental advocacy units? Yes. Yeah. You know, that where you pay a couple of people, the actual council workers who yeah. go around and they support yeah. renters who are struggling with their, you know, uh, yeah. with their landlords. Yeah. Um, they may be even, you know, look, councils find people for all sorts of ridiculous things. Why yeah. not find landlords exactly. you know, who are overcharging, yeah. you know, et cetera, or not repairing kitchens or toilets, yeah. you know? So it is absurd, you know, that yeah. we're charging, you know, we, we, we've had these situations, just this example, I'm sure they happen everywhere, where we've had to do petitions, mass mm. petitions, because councils threaten, for example, to find someone for planting their nature yeah. yeah. you know, a thousand dollars a day. Yeah. Well, we should be charging way more than a thousand a day on the landlord that, you know, won't fix your toilet. Exactly. What about if there's a landlord in your council that has asbestos that they won't remove from your a renter's kitchen? You know, sadly, sadly, pretty much that's what's happened. So yeah. one, one thing that's happened in, in Maribyrnong is, uh, as you probably know, the floods, right? Yeah. Floods in 22. So about 500 homes were really severely affected. One of the outcomes of that, which has been very little talked of, mm. is that all these grubby landlords there painted over black mold yes. in yeah. apartments and stuff, which now you've got the situation where we're hearing anecdotal stories of, you know, migrant families that don't, you know, just didn't know the lay of the, law of the land and go in there, pregnant women, you know, living in a situation where you've got black mold yeah. painted over. You which know? can kill you. Yeah. Absolutely. It's yeah. nuts. So yeah, it's happening. That's yeah. the sad thing. It's happening. Yeah. So do you think, do you think that's, that should be one of council's roles? Is that something council can do? Oh, look, it, it, those sort of things have existed in the past, like a uh, while back, years ago now, decades maybe, um, VU, so it wasn't Council for Victoria Uni, used to have like a unit that was an advocacy unit for not so much renters, in that case it was to fight developers actually, mm -hmm. but you could combine that because yeah. you're fighting the same people more yeah. or less. Yeah, yeah. The same so, person. <laughs> yeah, so you could actually have an advocacy sort of um, support unit within Council that supported renters and also supported people, you know, fighting developers. Yeah. You, because, you know, if a developer comes to do something that um, is going to severely affect your home, you know, mm -hmm. maybe cut out all your sunlight or yeah. whatever, you know, wreck your solar system, etc. whatever, there's millions of examples. Yeah. If it, you know, to, for you to take them on in VCAT, that's a lot of money. Yeah. And then they'll sometimes even in VCAT try to sue you for the cost. Yeah. yeah so yeah. it's near impossible to take them on. But that's where an advocacy sort of service unit, you know, in council, yeah. And it wouldn't even cost much. No, exactly. Yeah, and uh, I think, like, it's not it's not that that we're against development or like building or anything like that. I think it's more like the point that I want to get across is that the profit seeking when it comes to building houses has to stop. Like, it has to be like this is a human right. Uh, we do want houses, but we want houses to be, you know, fit for purpose. Things that aren't covered in mould from day one. Um, and also, these developers are profiting so much from their development. So, like, let's make them, and they're using land that was stolen, and they're, you know, cutting off society's access to that land to gain this massive profit by making shitty little units that they sell for huge profits. So, why don't we make them socialize some of their profits by building some public housing products? I think that's. Oh, look, exactly. And yeah, it's worth pointing out that in many cases, maybe in all cases, the land was stolen twice over. Yes. So yeah, it was yeah. stolen first, you know, from First Nations. Yeah. But then, uh, to give you a concrete example, in the Footscray context is a sort of almost, you know, some, sometimes, you know, being in council, a lot of people get angry. Mm. I have to laugh, because if yeah. I don't laugh, you would seriously, you know, you would be yeah. constantly stressed. So Footscray Hospital, which goes back a uh, long, long time, like mm. decades and decades, um, as people might know, the new uh, Footscray Hospital is being built, almost yep. finished. It, I think it will be the biggest. Anyway, the old site, which is still there, still functions as a hospital, that basically came out of community coming up with the money to buy yep. it. 
Yeah. So it's community money. Yeah. Now, what's it going to be turned into? Probably a prime real estate developer profit making yeah. you know, basin. Yeah. Um, that's what they're going to do with it. Yeah. The community, there's a, a lot of community sort of lobbying advocacy to try to at least get some social housing yeah. in there in some green space and all that stuff. But you can bet your bottom dollar that the state government has it earmarked for money making for developers yeah. first and foremost. And across the road, literally across the road, so as in you know, 100 meters away, is the one tower, a public housing tower that ha um, basically houses aged um, residents that's going to be demolished in Footscray. Yeah. So, you know, it's like a double whammy. They're going yeah. to sell off a hospital site paid for by people, you know, in the community themselves, sell off to developers, and then also give them the site across the road. How good. <laughs> yeah, no, I hate it all. <laughs> <laughs> it is, yeah, look, I mean, you, it is the sort of issue that just, you know, keeps yeah. giving, sadly. I mean, it's, I don't know how we get to that point where we make it so that these two main parties have much more to lose yeah. when it comes to the housing debate. Yeah, I agree. I think th there needs to be a threat. And the only thing that they care about are their profits and their jobs, and their cushy little government jobs. And the only thing that will make them listen to us, I think, is threat. Yeah, basically, there has to be more like the urgency that yeah. goes with that. Because otherwise, really, I mean, look, I, I suppose one way of thinking about it too, you know, you know, if you sort of in that situation here in Australia where younger person you're frustrated but you can't see why isn't it changing yeah. I think it is important to sort of think through that we are still I think officially the first or second richest country in the world that makes sense. per individual right so what that means in really practical terms is that you still have a middle class here that is comfortable yeah. which is not the case in the US yeah. it's increasingly not the case in the, um, the UK mm -hmm. it hasn't been the case in southern Europe for a long time so you're literally now talking about Northern Europe and Australia are the, probably the only areas of the entire globe where you have a middle class that still has spending money, yeah. can still travel, can still go to the shops. So that's what creates a certain stability. Yeah. But that same middle class, as comfortable as they may be, they've got kids who are not comfortable. Yes, so exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that's, I think it, it's, you know, those changes are coming. And, yeah. and other things will prompt them. Sometimes, you know, it, it, it may be that what begins the solution on housing is actually Palestine. Yeah, because think, you yeah. get you know you get sort of a crack, yeah. a crack in the consensus and the status quo, and people become aware of their own power, yeah. and then that translates to other things. I mean, if you yeah. think about it, you know, like the second wave of feminism was, has a lot to owe to a, a war in Vietnam, yeah. you know, yeah. and vice versa. And so it could be that you know what's happening in the globe very far away might be what creates a crack, and yeah. people start thinking, well, look, you know, enough's enough. Yeah, and it kind of it kind of explains. Uh, Labor's big push for uh, social cohesion and all that kind of stuff because they know that they're threatened like there are cracks appearing in the system that they've created and they don't want they don't want to be threatened so they're like oh please just play nice with each other be uh, have some social cohesion and uh, don't point at us <laughs> oh look it's funny you're, you're making me laugh saying that because one of the the, the favorite phrases I suppose chance of our labor councillors and our council is everybody love everybody <laughs> it's like yeah you know, they create crap yeah they pass shit policies yeah. and then it's everybody love everybody yeah, they, they put us <laughs> against each other and they're like don't fight yeah <laughs> <laughs> this is going to end really well yeah it's it's a real uh, actually it's a really good point you make i think the fact that they're having to fall back on that whole social cohesion argument and it's mm. happening in a lot of fronts like in the multiculturalism yeah. debate too yeah. the same thing yeah um is a real sign maybe of them sort of losing the reins yeah. a little bit? Yeah, I, I think so. And like Lenin spoke about them as well. Like these are liberals kind of in government that have used, you know, the working class to get them in, in power. And I don't know, I think I think that facade is cracking for them now and they recognise it and it's kind of like the old feudal lords that are like, oh, please, please play nice <laughs> yeah. while we, you know, control everything. <laughs> I, don't know, I feel like there's a lot of moments in history that we can turn to that kind of are reflective of now. What are you reckon? Yeah, look, and it would be poetic justice to if the big breaks in the neoliberal consensus happen with or in the context of the Labor government, because it's maybe an off the one thing that actually, probably, think about it, probably Australian Labor is probably the only social democratic party in the world that introduced neoliberalism. Yeah. Because neoliberalism Amazing. everywhere else was introduced by the Reagan, Thatcher, yeah. etc. But here it was Hawke. Yes. You know, so yeah. there would be a poetic justice. If, yeah. You know, it was under their governments that the big cracks that started it, to emerge. That it crumbled. <laughs> yeah. I, I agree. 
I agree. And hopefully... Hopefully, we'll see what happens. Uh, one great little thing, um, sort of not as related, but related to our conversation, mm. is we've got, we're approaching hopefully 200 people who've signed on council candidates supporting the Palestine pledge. Amazing. And maybe it's a bit of a sign to do yeah. the same thing, these cracks. Um, and what's interesting is a lot of these people, you go to forums where you, you, know, you meet these people and talk to them, and it's not just Palestine, they're talking yeah. about housing, yeah. you know, they're talking about social services like their role, yeah. you know, they're talking about all those social justice issues. Mm. Um, so people, it, you know, naturally the links come. Yeah. Um, so I suppose we can hope that maybe these council elections produce a little bit more of that break. Yeah. And I think the federal elections will be fascinating. Yeah, really I, fascinating. I agree. I think it's going to be interesting. But I think, yeah, people are looking for answers that the major parties aren't providing. And I feel like... That, like that's a shame on those parties, um, but hopefully it means people look to you know other parties, which you can see with the Greens, and you can see how much too it's pushed the Greens to sort of the left yes. in their politics. Because yeah. you know it, the Greens can go either way, and they have global. I mean, God, look, the German Greens are worse than our Liberal Party virtually. Yeah. I mean, they literally lead governments of war. Yeah. But uh, you know, in the UK here and in the US, you know, the yeah. Greens have moved yeah. leftwards. Look at look at the Greens in Outer Door. Like, yeah. they're killing it. Yeah, they're exactly. so well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's a sign, you know, yeah. what you're saying. Are these breaks? Yeah, yeah. I love it. Thank Ooh. you.